Hey there anthropologists, Eric Olson here with another video from Cuyahoga Community College. Today we're going to be talking about uh, world systems theory, which is something that we talk about in our cultural anthropology classes. And it's briefly mentioned, but I wanted to give it a little bit more uh, discussion because you'll find that a lot of the stuff that's talked about in world systems theory has a lot of parallels to some other topics, uh, particularly with politics and the concept of the state. So world systems theory is a social sciences uh, theory developed in the 1970s by Emanuel Wallerstein. And it's essentially a critique of modernization theory. And this is a thing that happened post-World War II where economists argued that you need to develop impoverished countries in order to lift them out of poverty. Well, what does development look like? Well, according to them in this, you know, post-World War II pro-capitalist economy, uh, essentially it was you need to build factories, you need to build roads, you need to build infrastructure, and when you build these things, then, you know, success and it will come and, you know, you'll elevate them out of poverty. And really what Wallerstein was doing was building off of prior research um, from prior anthropologists and prior social scientists, scientists, say that 10 times fast, just tongue twister there. Really, he breaks down world systems theory as both a unit of analysis. So instead of looking at nations as units of analysis, which is what modernization theory did, he's looking at the world as one economic unit. Now that we have a global economy, we need to look at the global economy in context of a system in of itself, as opposed to nations interacting with one another, which you still see today people you know, largely when they talk about economics and global trade, they're largely think of it in these these traditional 1950s economic terms instead of looking at it as a global system. And so Wallerstein is trying to buck that trend. And in doing so, he has to also um, frame the historical narrative in context of how do these nation states form and how do we get this legacy of the world system that we use today, which for context, Wallerstein is arguing that the world system is largely capitalist. And as such, Wallerstein and other people who follow world systems theory would argue that communism, as we understand it, doesn't actually exist in a world system because everyone's participating in a world capitalist system. Therefore, unless China totally shuts off its borders and only does things within its own borders and territory, it, it can't possibly be communist because it's interacting with the global world system. So we need to break down real quick here. Um, what are the four stages that Wallerstein talks about um, in the creation of the global economy? And he, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here that obviously there's, it's more complica complicated than these four stages, but, um, you know, this is a synthesis or a paraphrasing of his first volume. He wrote like four volumes on world systems theory. It's a lot of dense reading. So I'm kind of condensing a lot of it down for you. So the first stage that needs to happen, and you might recognize a little similarity to Wallerstein's first stage with um, some other philosophers like Michel Foucault and Antonio Gramsci. Yeah, Antonio Gramsci. Um, and that first stage is bureaucratization. This is where you have uh, codification, laws, uh, taxes, borders, and a central authority established. Essentially, you have ideological things that establish an imagined community like a nation um, and a territory and a unification around something. And this might sound similar to uh, when I've talked about in the past with the state, uh, sort of a creation of an ideology of nationalism, or more, more specifically, thinking of things like hegemony from Antonio Gramsci or normalizing power through Michel Foucault. So that's really stage one. You need to start having an ideology of this concept of a unified um, central authority. But then you need to have the guns to back it up. And this is where stage two of um, world systems theory historic progression comes into play. Uh, you need to have some sort of monopoly of force. Now, this might sound similar to someone we've talked about in the past. Uh, uh, Machiavelli, especially when we talk about the prince, this idea that, you know, laws and, and behaviors and, and the state maintains its control through force or the threat of violence. And so if we can't maintain control through an ideology such as hegemony, well, that's where the guns come in. And so if you don't follow things because you believe it's normal to do those things, well, that's where we have the people with the guns to tell you to do otherwise. Um, and this is the second stage where we have a consolidation of that power. Uh, we have territories being defended by armies, armies being formed. And we see a lot of that happening in, in the 1300s and the 1400s, particularly in Italy, where you have all these different duchies and provinces that aren't unified territories, and they start to consolidate power into um, one unified thing. 
And this is also, again, um, when we circling back to stage one, the church, which is why I use that stock photo of, of a monk, a lot of uh, bureaucratization is centralized around the Catholic Church in this time of roughly 400 to 1400 AD. And so the hegemony largely has to do with a unified religion, being Catholicism. And the third stage of uh, world systems theory is transitioning from agricultural surplus to industrial surplus. So this is where we see a lot of Wallerstein's work drawing on what we would call substantivist economists. And that would include people like also people like Marshall Solins, which also draws heavily on Karl Polanyi's work, uh, a substantivist econom economists. Uh, try saying that. It's just weird putting the emphasis on different things when you try to say substantivist economy, uh, economics. I, I just can't say the word. Um, and essentially the argument in substantivist perspective is that there is an unlimited number of wants, which we're all probably familiar with, with supply and demand. Um, <clears throat> there's a scarcity. The concept of scarcity applies to wants, but not necessarily to needs, because humans have a theoretically infinite way of fulfilling our minimum needs, food, water, shelter, uh, sex, um, et cetera, et cetera, Maslow's hierarchy kind of thing. But we theoretically have an infinite number of wants, and those are culturally derived. So some cultures want very little. We could look at Buddhism. We could look at um, a lot of hunter-gatherer societies, which is what Stone Age economics does. <clears throat> and so wants are theoretically infinite, but they are also culturally derived. And this is where it's important in stage three when we talk about the transition from agriculture to uh, industrialization is that we're shifting from surplus needs. So we have a surplus of food and food spoils. So there's a timetable to it. So we have to eat that food some point, otherwise it's gonna go bad. So it has a very short shelf life and it can't last in theory forever. To a shift in industrial goods, which it theoretically lasts forever. I mean, we still, archaeologically, we dig up all sorts of mass-produced goods starting in like the 15 and 1600s. You see a lot of mass production really ramp up in this time period. Um, <clears throat> and it's a shift towards that theoretically infinite. But there's a finite number of resources to fulfill those infinite needs, right? And whereas a substantivist would argue there is a theoretically infinite number of ways we could fulfill our finite needs. And so this shift from agriculture to industrialization means you're producing a lot of things and these things are being used to sell for a profit. So this is where we start to see the early formation of capitalism. This is where Wallerstein kind of breaks down our understanding of capital, which is to buy something to then sell at a higher price. Um, this is where he draws heavily on the works of Karl Marx in the mid 19th century. Um, and this is where you sort of have that Marxist critique built into world systems theory. Because again, it's coming off of the coattails of modernization theory in the 1950s. So um, Wallerstein is very much critiquing these very pro-capitalist, very free market based approaches to solving uh, global inequality. And so that's stage three. And the last stage that Wallerstein really focuses in on is exploration and new markets. This is where we have this situation of because you're producing new goods that are, uh, you know, based on finite resources for a theoretically infinite number of wants, you need to find new resources because you're going to run out of clay to make your pottery for people. You're going to run out of, of gold to sell to people to make your jewelry or what I mean, I'm using those as examples or your spices that people don't necessarily need. As much as I love spices as much as the next guy from a purely biological standpoint from sustenance, we don't technically need pepper on our food in order to survive. We can eat food without spices and still get the nutrients and calories that we need, right? Um, as much as we want to say otherwise, right? Um, so I'm not trying to say I'm, I'm anti-spice or anything. Um, but the spice trade is an important component when Wallerstein has been talking about the global economy because there's a circulation of spices uh, from China to Europe. And this is what kind of kickstarts a lot of the global economy is people in Europe want these spices and they want to have a more direct route to them. They don't want to be trading from the merchants in Venice. They don't want to have to get their spices from a long line of middlemen from China to say Portugal or Spain, which is why when we look at this fourth stage in world systems theory, exploration, we see who are the first people to start doing a lot of the exploring in what's known as the age of exploration. Well, it's Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, England. 
uh, France. It's a lot of the Western parts of Western Europe because they're at the tail end of the Silk Road, meaning they have everyone on the entire continent of Europe and Asia to interact with before those spices finally get to them. So they want to find direct routes to India. They want to find direct routes to China because they want to, they want to exploit these markets directly and bring those back to Western Europe so that they can then sell to the rest of Europe. And so this is where we see a lot of colonialism take form. And then we develop into eventually 1492, Christopher Columbus, um, you know, landing in the Caribbean, discovering, you know, North and South America and starting the global economy. So really world systems theory is modern, according to Wallerstein, in the sense that it's post 1492. Um, and when we start talking about colonialism and the triangle trade, which I have a nice little image here, we can see that this is where Wallerstein starts to get this idea of core, periphery, and semi-periphery, or rather core, semi-periphery, and periphery. And really what he's arguing is that you have uh, the periphery, which is the colonies that are exploited for their natural resources or their people. So in this case, that's largely Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, uh, basically the global south. And then you have uh, semi-periphery, which are colonies that are largely filled with colonists, so people that um, move to these colonies to flee persecution, to find a new uh, job, all sorts of different reasons that you see emigration from Europe to these semi-periphery countries. And you see a lot of those are, tend to be places today like North America. So you have Canada in the U.S., you have uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, and so these make up largely the semi-periphery. Uh, these are places that aren't quite um, colonial superpowers in of themselves, at least for most of the history of Wallerstein's world systems, but eventually do become their own sort of global dominators. Uh, obviously, the U.S. and Canada become, you know, big in the global economy, same with Australia and New Zealand, but for a very long time, they are part of, you know, the British colonies. Uh, and so I've actually got an image here of you know, the British colonies in 1921 to really illustrate um, what Wallerstein is emphasizing. Again, this is post-World War II uh, development and modernization theory that Wallerstein is critiquing. So, you know, in 1921, obviously this is going to look a little different in the 1960s and the 1950s, but we can see a lot of countries are still under British rule. And we can see, well, where's the core? The core is Britain and Ireland. And then the semi-periphery would be places like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and the United States. And a lot of these other countries are in what we would call the periphery, where they're getting their natural resources exploited, where you have, you know, uh, Ghana, which is where 40% of the world's uh, cacao, so the chocolate that you eat in your chocolate bars, 40% of it is grown in Ghana. Uh, and then another 20-ish percent is grown in Cote d'Ivoire. Or I might have that backwards. But point is, these two countries right here, uh, produce two-thirds of all the chocolate in the world, at least the raw materials. They themselves do not have factories where they make chocolate. So, you know, that chocolate bar you're eating, it's actually made probably in Great Britain or the United States or Canada or Switzerland, but the, the actual beans themselves are grown in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, more likely than not. And so this kind of gets back to what Wallerstein is talking about, is that you have these periphery countries that don't have factories, that don't have the means of production, to go back to that sort of Karl Polanyi, Karl Marx, um, Marx's critique, uh, they have the raw materials, but they do not make the finished industrialized products. And so that's really what Wallerstein's world system is talking about, is that we're living in a global economy that depends on resource extraction to fulfill um, a capitalist system. And we need to understand it not as nations working with, with one another, but as a global system and how how materials are moved across the globe isn't necessarily something that makes sense when we look at it as a nation, as an economic unit, when we look at the whole globe as an economic unit. And that's really what Wallerstein is trying to argue when talking about global world systems, is he's talking about the globe as an economic unit as opposed to, say, the United States or Canada or Great Britain, because we are, you know, an entire culture that is globalized, right? We can communicate with people halfway around the world. I can communicate to you via YouTube to anyone across the world. And so it, it behooves us as anthropologists when we talk about global economics or economics in general to talk about how it's interconnected globally and how the impacts of my decisions to buy, you know, a cup of tea 
uh, from an Irish tea company. That's an example right there. The tea I'm drinking. It says it was founded by Barry's Tea in Ireland, 1901. But they're not growing the tea leaves. The tea leaves are grown in probably India or China or Southeast Asia somewhere. And then they're exported to um, wherever the factory is in Ireland where they, you know, cut the tea up or, you know, roll it into tea bags and then ship it out to the United States. So we need to understand that the economics that we're talking about is not some, oh, Irish company or it's, you know, the tea is, is made elsewhere. We need to understand the complexities of how these things interwork together. So that's a lot to take in. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense. Uh, to recap, uh, Global World Systems, the four stages are bureaucratization, military power, transition from agriculture to industry, and exploration of new markets. And hopefully that helps explain a little bit better when we're talking about global economics in you know our anthropology lessons. We have that in our back pocket and of our toolkit in anthropology to better understand how things are working in everyday life. So that even something as simple as a cup of tea can actually be quite complicated when we start, start to understand where it came from and how it moved across the globe. So that's going to do it for today. And until next time, never stop learning. Mm -hmm.